and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 8 verse 20 to chapter 9 verse 17. Be reminded as you turn there that this is God's holy word. Every single word of it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is without error of any kind, and it is the only final authority in all that we are to believe and do. Be addressed by God Himself as you hear, starting in chapter 8, verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as, as I have given you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply, team on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant. It is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your covenant grace. We thank you for your goodness in all creation, even for those who do not know you, as we at one time did not know you. And yet you have caused the sun to come up every morning for rains, to produce crops on the earth, even as your providence brings both that which is a cause of our sin in the curse and that which is goodness that we don't deserve. Help us to be able to parse these things out today in a way that is appropriate and fitting and stays within the confines of your word, what you would have us know. Teach us now, Lord, by your Holy Spirit and cause my words to serve that end. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title is creational covenant reaffirmed and distinguished. You notice, by the way, the sign that ended the passage is a rainbow. And of course, 
our culture attempts to co-opt that sign as well. You know, every lie is a twisted truth. The devil can't create. He must twist something that already exists. All that is bad is some kind of a twisted good, distorted, plucked from its context. And so you see our culture trying to appropriate for itself the rainbow for evil ends. But God meant it for good. God is speaking about himself. And it's very ironic that this ends a chapter, so to speak, in God's dealing with man where he judges an entire people for the most perverse sins. And so how perverse is it to try to appropriate that sign to celebrate the very perversity that stands in judgment? Well, let me orient us to the very simple diagnostic question. I even thought to ask it before I read the passage. But as you hear the passage today, and God obviously has an immediate audience, and I want us to consider the immediate audience because in this passage, there's a clear application to everybody. Here's my question. If you hear things addressed in our text today from God to Noah, to Noah and all his sons and all their generations, well, who all is being addressed? You should raise your hand. Me, us, all of us. And you say, well, uh, an unbeliever wouldn't, wouldn't affirm that. This is in your book. We even make that mistake when we say, well, these are laws of Moses, and didn't Moses even write this book? Yes, God is taking him back, though, to his covenant with all mankind, which doesn't depend on you buying into this book. You're in it, whether you like it or not. So as we reflect on that, here's the three things we're going to see about this covenant and all mankind. Three things. We'll see something about blood, duties, and sign. The blood of the covenant to all mankind. Secondly, the duties of the covenant to all mankind. And thirdly, the sign of the covenant to all mankind. Notice I keep saying to all mankind. We need to understand that very clearly. The big idea is this. Here's the doctrine for today. That God bound himself to preserve the world till the end and bound man to propagate life and punish those who violate it. Right there, I just offended 99% of Americans. And we must. We are answerable to God to do our side of the covenant. And what if nobody cooperates? Find new friends who will cooperate and obey God with you. That has a lot of implications, which we'll get to in Genesis 10 and 11. But let me repeat that. God bound himself to preserve the world till the end and bound man to propagate life and punish those who violate it. Let's first look at the blood of the covenant to all mankind. You think blood of the covenant, you think maybe Exodus 24, Moses and those people. But you know a lot of those people fell in the wilderness. They weren't really saved. Jesus repeats it in Luke 24, uh, the Last Supper, the upper room. The blood of the new covenant. He appropriates that to God's people. <clears throat> well, here, <clears throat> you say, well, this isn't even the same thing in any way. Well, in one sense, that's true. It's a different, it's a wider people group, but the blood is still functioning the same way. Let's see how it is in verse 20 of chapter 8. And, and notice I said already that Noah was playing the role of priest for his family. It says, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. So the first thing he does when he gets off the boat. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. This helps to understand why the food laws later on in Leviticus are what they are. It wasn't anything intrinsic in the particular animals. Jesus makes that clear in Matthew 7 when he declared all food clean. Or when Peter had his vision in Acts 8 when he was on the housetop of Cornelius and God says, rise, eat. Peter's like, no way. I'm, I'm Jewish. I, I'm not supposed to eat. These are pigs. That's bacon. No way. But God called it clean in and of itself. So something, when he calls it unclean in Leviticus, something symbolic has to, and we call that ceremonial. Why were these laws what they were? That's going to help us when we come to the next chapter as well, chapter 9, verse 4, where it says, but you shall not 
eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. You see that theme throughout Leviticus as well. Now, this comes up in the provision for eating. So he's like, he's moved on from the priestly stuff, right? He's moved on from the altar. That was chapter 8. But even when he gives this provision for all mankind, something ceremonial is still going on. So I bring this up here because the exception shows us, the exception of what you can't eat, even though I'm giving you everything except for this. Well, Calvin says here that this restriction was part of the old law. By old law, he means the law of Moses. And again, you're like, whoa, law of Moses, that's later. We're we're here to all mankind, not God's people. True, but there's something foreshadowed. There's something man needs that it wasn't just Israel needing it. We all need something that has to do with blood. Now, we've got a lot of theologizing to do because when you read this passage, you see more things about God and God interacting with man. And we've got to get used to this in the Bible where it looks like God's being depicted like a man. He's got a voice. He talks. He turns. He's got an arm. He's got a leg. You're like, he doesn't have any of those things. So this is another anthropomorphism when it says in verse 21 that when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, what's going on there? God doesn't have a nose. He doesn't literally smell things. But you're going to see this everywhere in Scripture, so we got to get used to it. This is the Bible's way of saying, on a need-to-know basis, in a way that we can understand, that someone's worship is acceptable to the Lord. It pleased Him. Even about the work of Christ, Paul says in Ephesians 5, 2, that it is a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. There's obviously nothing physically fragrant in a bloody sacrifice, in fact, quite the opposite. But it's a way of saying that it pleased God. It appeased God. God was angry. This appeased His anger. God had just and righteous wrath. Something about this satisfied His justice. But those are very abstract concepts. So the Bible uses this language about aromas. Because we can understand, and even in religious worship, that's used candles and incense and things like that on a physical level to demonstrate something that's harder to think about. This pleased God. Very next breath, it says in verse 21, the Lord said in his heart, here again, we have to think, said in his heart, God reveals communication. In a sense, what's going on inside the life of the Trinity But again, it's not there for us to speculate. What does that look like? What is that? Well, it doesn't look like him starting to talk because that's not something that God has in his nature. He does this in a way that man can understand it. He stoops down to our level. It's the only way that we can understand what is meant by his will. He is showing us that this was his will. He's not reacting to this sacrifice and saying, okay, now I'm good. He ordained the whole thing. He meant for man to have some representative. In other words, he loved us beforehand. He graciously took the first step. What is this divine resolve? He continues, I will never again curse the ground because of man. You think this is like something he patches on later? No, from the beginning he ordained it. I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. Now, you might have caught it. That just added another level of difficulty. As you read that just in your regular English Bibles, you're like, I will not do this bad thing because, and you're expecting some good thing that mitigates against it, right? For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. I've never said to my kids, I will not punish you again in this way because you are going to continue to do this wicked thing. Wouldn't that be a grounds to totally plan to punish them more, maybe even more severe until they get the point? Well, God is going to do that in some ways, and then again in a final way. But that's not what he wants us to hear here. The word for there, because man is sinful in this way, therefore the world will go on. Well, here's what's really happening. 
This is not a ground or reason for God to change any kind of a strategy. He does this on account of the sacrifice. That's why it's there. The function of man is like this is more of a kind of a realism. To say, in spite of, or that being the case, man is going to continue in sin. I just want you to know, Noah, this is not me fixing everything, and then it's going to go wrong again so that you can say to God, well, why didn't the pieces hold together again? God is having it. He's building an expectation in us. He doesn't need one. He already knows. He's building an expectation in us of man's trajectory. We're going to continue to get worse. What's highlighted here is God's mercy, God's goodness. We should have actually a building surprise that God would have a kind intention to humanity given that man is not fixed at this point. Let's add the final stamp on this divine resolution. It emphasizes the connection, and you're going to hear me use this language. I've used it already last week. (coughs) The common elements and the holy elements. In other words, those things that are nature or creation, it's it's what man experiences in common as a human being, and then the holy or the special, the new thing that God is doing to fix the world. And so in verse 22, you start to see the the interplay between them. They're not worlds apart. They're related to each other. It says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Do you recognize those words from the hymn, great is thy faithfulness? And, And it comes from this. This is good news to us. Now, because of the sacrifice, that hits us differently than it does for the unbeliever. But if God is faithful precisely in a blessing to all mankind, how could an appeasing sacrifice for sin be a part of that? The world outside of Christ has no part in that saving grace. So one of the difficulties of this covenant, as opposed to the other ones in Scripture, and it keeps theologians scratching their head and trying to resolve it in different ways, is How do I separate, or do I, what applies here to all mankind versus what clearly can only apply to the elect? And there's a lot of answers to it, but at the core of the answer is this. Though the reprobate, those that are not chosen and placed in Christ, though the reprobate are not a party to the saving benefits, the saving grace, nevertheless, the whole world continues to live under many good conditions. And all the good conditions that they live under are because of that grace. Even the unbeliever who will not benefit fully and finally or be included in Christ at all, nevertheless draw every breath that they do because of the kindness and mercy of God and patience which would not exist if God was not doing something more special, if He was not aiming this whole old world toward a new world in Christ. So when Paul says, for example, here's a good verse for this, 2 Corinthians 1.20, the kind of verse that's at the beginning of a letter that you might tend to just skip past, listen to what Paul says. All the promises of God find their yes, or I think one translation says, find their amen in Him. And you're like, well, uh, What? What's that mean? Well, think about it for a second. All of God's promises, so just His promises to the elect. Ultimately, but has He ever promised anything, even if specifically to Christ and His people, have benefits? Unappreciated benefits, benefits which will add to the guilt of the unbeliever on Judgment Day. But in Genesis 8 and 9, do you see God making a promise? We do. It's a covenant of promise. Paul saying that all promises that God makes are what they are. They hit their target. God sees it through to the end. They are guaranteed to happen. Why? Because of Christ. The reason that every unbeliever has any good thing happen to them is because of the grace of Christ in the gospel, though they themselves will not be recipients of that special grace. Why? 
Because God cares more about his glory than even us parsing this out. How's God glorified in that? God would have Christ be magnified above all things, and therefore the show must go on in creation. Because I've got something much greater in mind than Adam or Noah or even Abraham or Israel, certainly more than the nations. I've got one who is coming who I am going to glorify myself in. Therefore, the world will go on. Not that there's not other ends that God has in the old world, but the chief end for which God preserves the earth now is the glory He will obtain in the new world by His Son. Therefore, all human beings experience every single sunrise that they do, every single childbirth, every single birthday, every single hobby and pleasure and friendship because Christ must be glorified in the new world. Secondly, there are the duties of the covenant to all mankind. You see the promise. Maybe that's obvious to see. Maybe the duties are not. But if you especially zoom in on chapter 9, going especially in verses 5 and 6, but even the things leading up to that, you can divide the duties into two categories. Those that were already explicit to Adam back in Genesis 1 and 2, and now they're maybe being unpacked in some way, and that brings up the second division, and this is where theologians disagree with each other, is the second division things that were implicit in Genesis 1 and 2, and now he's unpacking it, he's making it clearer or holding up a magnifying glass to Noah and saying, now I really meant by that, Noah, back to Adam, you're going to carry this out specifically. Or is he adding something new on top of that? And that's where the disagreements will be. But all parties will have to at least notice a twofold division. Genesis 1 and 2, Genesis 9, and there's a unity. I, I wanted to call this uh, creational covenant 2.0. Then I realized, is that like old language from like 20 years ago <laughs> with new computers that come out? I don't know if people talk like that anymore. But I used to say that Adam 2.0 is about Israel. And this is creation covenant 2.0. And you see, what do I mean by duties? Multiply and have dominion. Remember them? In Genesis 1, 28 through 31. Verse 1 here, chapter 9, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Sounds like God is still committed to you being fruitful and multiply and fill. If you hear anybody in the church, and the amount of people that say this is legion, even in Reformed churches, well, the creational covenant is not in effect anymore because of the fall. Are you trying to say that we're really bad at it because we're sinners? Okay. But the duty is still there. And then secondly, dominion receives an upgrade here. Even though you have sin, and maybe God is coming in to do this to help us because of the curse, two divine blessings to ensure its possibility about the animals, he puts a disposition in the animals. Verse 2, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast. He didn't have to do that in chapter 1. Because there was no fall yet. Now he does. But secondly, he gives the animals to man for their sustenance. Verse 3, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. People see gave and give. And what comes up? Okay, they were not meat eaters before this. They were vegetarians. Some will take that position. Most theologians, I know in the commentaries, most of them, Calvin included, they would say, no, this is highlighted for a different reason because he's going to make that separation about the use of animals for ceremonial purposes versus this, but it was already implied. Now, I'm not going to resolve that for people now. You know, people can think what they want to about that. But there's food, and there's also implied here domestication of animals. So you've got oxen for labor. You've got horses for travel. You've got dogs and other such creatures for pets. All of that is in view here in God giving the animals to man. And of course, that does not mean abuse of animals. That means that we wisely steward the resources, just like from chapter 1 and 2. Nothing would change about that. But the second category that he brings in in verses 5 and 6, and you especially see it in verse 6, is something that is either brand new, as some argue, because the effects of sin, or it's something that was latent in the nature of man having dominion But now that takes on a different dimension now that there's sin. 
now that there is a violent feature in mankind. And there's an interpretive difficulty because it appears that there's again that mixing of the ceremonial and moral law in verses 5 and 6. They're so closely intertwined that you're bound to have debates about them. And I hear this sort of thing all the time. For your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. So one of the things that comes up and is, well, if this is about the beginnings of human government or about capital punishment or the just use of force, what about the animals? Because he's, he's requiring this reckoning from man and beast. One of the answers to that is in the law of Moses that if an ox scores somebody, for example, or today it'd be a pit bull or something like that, that there is restitution. So it's from, and in some of those laws of Moses, the animal dies. And you could debate that all day you, you want, but I'm just saying that that's part of the answer for why these are intertwined. But another answer, the big picture, again, I would say, well, you shouldn't be separating them to begin with. That's our bad presupposition, that these are what we, Sunday me, Sunday Christian, and six day a week me. Here's the spiritual me, and here's the secular me, and as a big fat wall of separation between the church and everything else in life. Well, that's your first problem. The Bible doesn't make that separation. It does distinguish between the ceremonial law and the moral law. But the key words are here. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Just like chapter 3, verse 15. Who's the speaker here? I will require. Who's requiring? God. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed for God made man in his own image. God is not making a prediction. This will happen. You see that in places of Scripture. Whoever lives by the sword shall die by the sword. There's places in the Psalms that talk about that for the man of violence. Not here. Here God is requiring a reckoning. He's not making a prediction. You shall do this. Five clear points about verses 5 and 6. Too many people don't believe. This would not have been controversial before 80 years ago. First, this commandment is to all mankind following Noah. They're the only ones around. They're the lone survivors of humanity. When God says, you and all that follow you, he me you cannot say. But that's just Israel's book. False. First of all, you're not following the story very well. That comes later in Exodus. But no. Every human being is duty-bound to live under this rule. Secondly, this, as I just said, is a divine command. Oh, that was just an idea they had in the 17th century or Western retributive. Stop! Stop, cheat. Stop being a devil. God is speaking and saying, I will require a reckoning. Third, the substance of the command is to take the life of the murderer. In other words, there is something like a just use of force against an unjust use of force. We find more confirmation of that throughout the Old Testament when God commands the armies of Israel or a king to take life, when he gives the sword in Romans 13, but especially in the sixth commandment, where the Hebrew word for murder, not kill, they're two distinct words, is used, which is where the King James messes up, by the way. When it says kill, the word should be murder as distinguished from killing because the Bible and the Hebrew language makes this distinction between a just taking of life and an unjust taking. Fourthly, the ultimate reason given by God for this response to murder is that the murdered man is made in the image of God. Or as Calvin says, that God so highly esteems our life that he will not suffer murder to, be so, to, to go so unavenged. Now you say, well, yeah, and that's why he'll punish it in the end. Sure, that's why he'll punish it in the end, but that's not what he says here. He's ordained someone to punish it now. He'll still punish it in the end. Fifthly and finally, and these are just obvious observations from the text, the immediate context before and after this verse is a reiteration of the language of the original covenant with Adam to multiply, to exercise dominion. When you put these five facts together, there emerges from the very nature of things, and that's why it's moral law, a mandate from God for some group of men 
to use a just kind of force to punish or ideally to prevent the unjust kind of force that is violence to the image of God. The extreme of that is murder. But as the rest of the law of Moses, and especially the second table of the Ten Commandments makes plain, all the other ways that you can violate the image of God exist within that. And that's the basis of what's called the lex talionis in the law of Moses, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, etc. Why? Because man was made in the image of God. It's like God saying, in effect, you mess with man, you're messing with me. Not that you can violate God and injure him, but that you would presume to do so. It's his property. One commentator, Belcher, summarizes what all parties used to typically agree to. Quote, It is appropriate to see here the foundation of government and that capital punishment is an appropriate response to murder. Now, I said this was uncontroversial in ages past. That's true among the Orthodox. That doesn't mean that there haven't been fringe groups. The anarchist, for example, in all ages, has objected to the government part. Pacifists and other modern liberals have objected to capital punishment. Sometimes they'll even say, well, doesn't Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount do away with all that? No. Jesus was talking about your private offense. I have a sermon on it from last year, if you want to listen back to it. He was not talking about the magistrate or the public official. Now, those are the duties of the covenant. Finally, the sign of the covenant to all mankind. Now, I should mention before I point to the sign specifically, the rainbow, that when you think about those duties we just listed, they come with blessings. These are not like, oh, great, duties. No, these are, these are the great things in life. These are things I think we would all agree are great in life, propagating human beings, children. I know you might not think of work like that, but we all have a passion to do certain things, and that falls under dominion. So just like Genesis 1 and 2, so here in chapter 9, the duties are actually blessings. <clears throat> Verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons. You see that? First word there is blessed. Verse 2, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every. So you say, well, I'm going to have you in this relationship with the animals. If you're in the ancient world, your first response is, that doesn't sound too pleasant after the way things have been going. He's going to put the dread of you. Into your hands they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. What's he doing? God is gifting mankind with various things. So when he gives us these duties, there are these corresponding blessings. These are things that God simply gives. There's nothing we did to have deserved it. And that's one of the reasons why this will sometimes go, and this is controversial too, called common grace. Not saving grace, but something he gives that are fundamentally blessings and good things that human beings don't deserve. Now to the sign itself. Every covenant has signs and seals. That's one of the ways that you know there's a covenant going on, and we saw that in Genesis 2. Here you don't need that clue because he just tells you. He uses the word covenant. But he says this, I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Notice he uses that comprehensive language to say that this covenant is with everyone and everything from here on forward just making it crystal clear. When I bring, and that's why I love when a rainbow, you know, oh, look, there's a rainbow. It covers everything. It's God's way of saying, everything is encompassed here. You're not getting away. This is all mine. I've given it to you, but I expect these duties. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. He wants us to remember Signs of the covenant are later used that the people of God will look back at God's promise. He doesn't need to remember, but we do. To say my bow has suggested to many commentators of all stripes the idea that God's battle bow is laid aside. Some even think that God is, it's shaped that way, think of it, where he is bending back, which way? Toward heaven. It's almost like he, he is saying that I will, and by the way, it's not the only time he does this. In Genesis 15, the tearing of the animals and the pieces, that represents that if anybody goes back on their side of the covenant, they will be torn to pieces. You see that later in Jeremiah. 
But in that covenant in Genesis 15, I'm stealing my thunder from that, God walks through the pieces alone. He's saying, I will take upon myself the bad things of this covenant. And so if this idea is true, that he's doing that with the rainbow, I will take upon myself. And it's not, and we know the story, it's not an if. He does. We'll get to that in the application. But I think that makes a lot of sense, especially following this decisive act of vengeance that the flood represented. So he reiterates in verse 17 that it's more than that. He calls it an everlasting covenant between God and every living creature. Now, if you know your Bible, you know that the covenant he makes with Abraham and then eventually the church comes out of that is also called an everlasting covenant. You can kind of make sense of that. Everlasting. Heaven, the future. How is this everlasting? If this is just to preserve the earth till the end, Well, clearly, it's not about the world considered in itself, much less a promise to those outside of Christ to be everlasting. However, we have to remember that the new creation is, after all, a creation. Redeemed human nature is human nature. He's not starting over in a way where he takes back what he started. Some theologians will say it like this, grace perfects nature. Grace doesn't just restore nature like a reset to Adam, but something infinitely greater. Yet, bodies, trees, food, organization, a bunch of things you might be tempted to say, well, that's bad and that's part of the fall. No. God is committed when he says, I am making all things new. He is doing that with his creation. So that's what he means. Let's apply this three different ways. First of all, now this might seem heady at first, but please bear with me. It's crucial. It makes or breaks how Christians interpret this passage and understand things like law and government and the image and even the Ten Commandments. You won't understand the Ten Commandments if you don't understand this. There is another erroneous view that's popped up in our day. It's been called the radical two-kingdom view. And They especially tend to hang out at Westminster West. But the view is not new in that sense. A lot of people have held to things like this, the Anabaptist in particular. But this view has been given a lot more respectability by a guy named David Van Drunen. And he also, he would agree that when you look at Romans 13 and the sword and God's design for civil government, that it finds its origins in Genesis 9, 5, and 6. And that's traditional interpretation. We agree. He sees the seeds of a just use of force in a Noahic covenant. So far, so good. We agree. But he draws a sharp and impenetrable division between the common community that God makes of the whole world in Noah. So you have a common sphere, and that's where you see man living together with man in political society. But then you have a holy, special community that God makes of Abraham and those of the covenant of grace. Well, I agree, they are two different covenants, but remember, don't divorce those. Now, this is what makes it so hard. He doesn't deny that Christ reigns over both kingdoms, so the church and the state. He doesn't even deny that Christians may take part in civic life. They're not like your grandfather's pietism. Ooh, politics, dirty. No, they say Christians can even be judges and journalists and presidents and so on, but they can't be too successful at it. Now, they wouldn't say it like that, but that's what they're going to drive at. What they're very careful to guard against is the idea that the Old Testament people's government can in any way serve as a template, as a rule, for other secular governments. And you can kind of understand why. I would reject the view that the purpose of civil government today is to replicate the law of Moses. That's a view called theonomy. Sometimes it's called uh, reconstructionism. I think it has a lot of problems. I agree with them opposing that. But in the process of opposing that, they wind up destroying the traditional idea of moral law standing over civil government and standing over us. 
This has implications for how we apply the moral law to all kinds of contexts. Think of the duty in this passage to defend the image of God. Yes, centrally that means to defend the life of man. But as you read on in the law, all of those things that the Ten Commandments begins to include in the life of man, whether it be liberty or authority or marriage or property and so on, violations of those are violations against what? You say, well, against God. Sure, ultimately. But immediately, if you violate commandments 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, who are you immediately violating? The image of God. That's the logic of Genesis 9, 5, and 6. Van Drunen goes in a different direction. He says this about Genesis 9, 5, and 6. Contrary to popular assumptions, contrary to the traditional view, you meant to say, contrary to popular assumptions, the reason this text appeals to the image of God is probably not to highlight why murder is so bad, but to explain why God delegates such a profound authority to human beings. Okay, he he is delegating authority to Noah and his sons in some way, but what did you catch there? The reference to God's image in this text, he is saying, is not a reference to that which is attacked, but to him who avenges it. In other words, the image, the representative of God who bears the sword. What I want you to think about in the image is how that representative, that Caesar or that president or whoever else, that he has my authority to wield that sword. I agree. It's just Romans 13. He isn't talking about the image. You say, well, well, he's going to be punished if he's a tyrant. True at the end. But he's saying that's none of your business in the present. What all of this does, long story short, is it's one more separation of the church and the state, that you are not to hold this book and its law over the state, that that common sphere belongs to all of us, and you are not to seek a Christian imposition, you're not to impose things of the new world on the consciences of people in the old world. Question, what if the consciences of the people in the old world want to, you know, murder a bunch of people? You know, genocide, honor killing in Islam. Just to mention a couple, that's not a Christian interpretation. That's just the moral law that God has placed over all human beings. The image of God and the function in that passage is clear. God is saying, if you mess with the image of God, you mess with me. From the highest of kings to the lowliest of janitors. And therefore, you are to prevent that. You are to stop that bloodshed. Calvin spoke for the majority Christian tradition to the contrary. He said, men are indeed unworthy of God's care if respect be had only to themselves. But since they bear the image of God engraven on them, he deems, God deems himself violated in their person. That's Calvin's nicer way to say, if you mess with me, or sorry, if you mess with the image of God, you mess with me. This passage is an exhortation for us, finally. What application is there for me? I mean, you could look at this passage and say, well, that's great for Noah and those first kings and patriarchs and even for people today, but you know what? (coughs) I'm not even a parent anymore. My kids are out of the house. They're grown. I'm not childbearing anymore. Uh, True. But in the church, you can support in various ways those who still do have kids in the home. You can pray for them. You can help them in various ways. You can come to their support. You could say more specifically to what I was just talking about, I'm not a king. I'm not even a judge. not even a police officer. I have no power to affect any of that. Well, that may be true. But... Every citizen, especially in a society like ours, has various levels of influence over what civil magistrates or populations do. Sometimes very little, but whatever you have, you must conform your view to God's law. And we have no excuse in our own day right here in Florida in just four weeks. There is a direct ballot initiative 
with your name on it because it's a direct ballot initiative. An amendment, Amendment 4, that is deceptively worded to allow a precedent to start where there be no parental consent whatsoever. And when you combine the not very well-worded who gets to be a physician or healthcare, it doesn't have to be them. Then what you do is you set up a medical tyranny and a situation in which judges can then later on begin to read into that and legislators reading into that any kind of confiscation of children for any kind of perceived medical attention, which includes now more than abortion, which would be an abomination enough, but can include gender assignment surgery. You have to think in terms of dominoes here. But at the very least, the proverb tells us in Proverbs 24, 11, and 12. So vote no on that, by the way. Oh, I wasn't clear about that. Vote no. It's a blank check, and it's meant to be. Proverbs 24, 11, and 12 says, Rescue those. This is a command. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? What did God just say? If you say, I don't know what you're talking about, God knows exactly how much you know. And you can't say to a preacher, which is, by the way, why so many people want preachers to shut up about politics. Matt, you just made me know more than I knew. You robbed me of some of my innocence. Good. Because in our society today, we who have been given much will be answering for that much. Don't pray that God would give you less, but that you will know the day and the hour in which you live and stand in the gap for people who cannot speak for themselves. God demands this of us. And finally... This covenant is promise. We might have to think about that this week. Whenever it rains, we might think of that flood and judgment, but we need to think about the God of His promises that is taking center stage in this passage. Whenever we see the rainbow on the other side, know that the bow of divine justice has in fact been bent back already. That's not just prospective, hypothetical, but he, in fact, did for his people plunge the arrow of his wrath into his own son on the cross. Isaiah 53.10 says, It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. Whatever comes out on the other side, look to that rainbow and look to it through God's eyes in the gospel. Let's pray. <laughs>